Okay, it looks like because we have about two people left that I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so, when I originally came out about a week, well, when I originally started sending the emails to Doreen and Emma about a week or two ago, I couldn't really figure out what was going on. So I went ahead and was saying, look, I want to come out and want to do a talk on recruiting for BA this month at, uh, sometime during the career fair. So, what happened was that I was going back and forth through, it was like, yes, come out, do this, and while you're at it, do a talk on time. Because she had seen me bitching about this on Google+. And so, she's called me out, and here it is. So, first things first. Point her back. There we go. I see a lot of new faces, and so I want to talk a little bit about myself, who I am, what I do, and where I came from. My name is Charmaine. Mm -hmm. I... Hello, guys. I graduated the class of 2011 out of this, the RIT software engineering program. I was the head of mentoring here for a while. So a lot of faces here, I do see a lot of people, and it's really great to be back and actually stand up here and do another talk because I miss it. I really. I, I will say, though, I, I'm a little nervous because I haven't actually stood up in front of anyone and talked in about a year and a half since my last crash course. So I, I may be a little bit rusty. Right now, I'm a software engineer for BA Systems. I started there immediately after graduation. I did a number of co-ops through there. And what, pretty much senior year, come Christmas, uh, an offer appeared in my inbox, which is a fantastic gift for them. That was my full-time offer, and I picked up about a week after graduation. My domain for what I do was typically ISR, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. And the idea behind that is we go through and we fly drones over the battlefield, we figure out information, we pull pictures, we pull cell phone logs, radio transmissions, and we get that information to the troops, to the commanders, for what they need to know so they can better accurately make their jobs, make their persistence. I've worked with distributed systems that span both the air and the ground, multi UAVs talking to each other. I've gone through, I've done RF signals exploitation, where we go through and actually listen to a cell phone signal, break the encryption, figure out who it is, where they are, what they do. Uh, direction finding, figuring out where that person is. IFF, identification, friend or foe. And uh, a lot of really nifty technologies like that. I've recently, if you were here at my talk earlier today, I've recently transferred into the research and development division. And what I do now is uh, multi-vehicle mission management. And the idea behind that is if we have six or seven UAVs in the air, how do we best task them to solve the traveling salesman problem and hit every single target on the ground? I have a passion for aeronautics, space, anything uh, that flies through the air, physics related, science, all of that cool stuff. I'm working towards my pilot certificate. Uh, I'm flying a little single engine Cessna and that's incredibly fun. I'm an avid geocacher, hiker, and I'm a certified ski instructor. So while I do really like to play in, in the sky and the air, I do like to get outside and out behind the computer every once in a while. Snarker, you forgot snarker. And, I, and I'm a terrible <laughs> snarker. So when I was sitting there, I'm thinking, of all of the reasons, why? Why would Doreen recommend that I stand up here and talk a little bit about time and software? Well, it really started with one of the first assignments I had coming out of college at BA Systems. Um, I was talking a little bit about the Argus program earlier today, if you were at that talk. And the basics behind that is, if you weren't there, it's a really high resolution camera that straps onto a, uh, a UAV helicopter, flies around and takes pictures. The problem was that that was still a DARPA prototype at the time I joined that. And the way they were testing it was that they were actually taking the entire pot, strapping it to a Black Hawk helicopter and flying it around. And that was how they were testing the system. As you can imagine, that was extraordinarily expensive. That was something in the order of fifty to $60,000 an hour for the pilot, the helicopter, the fuel, all of the ground services and everything to do that. So the problem is management said, come up with something better. This is entirely unacceptable. So what did they do? They pulled a couple of software engineers and they said this. Make the pod, make the pod think it's flying while it's on the ground. And honest to God, this is the sum total of the entire direction I got when, we got, when I started this program. Management said, make it think it's flying. And I'm like, well, well hell, OK. What does that mean? What, what would you do with that? So I stepped back, and I talked to every person I could probably find who had worked on this plot. I gathered as much possible information as I could. And what really happened was identified, I identified a couple of nav, navigational interfaces that provide this data over RS-232, a couple of serial lines, and Ethernet to actually deliver that information to it. So, step back, me being the software engineer I am, what was my solution to this? Well, 
fully fledged distributed flight path generation system that will actually go through and generate this flight path and distribute that navigation information to the pod itself while it's sitting on the ground. And of course, I had a pretty awesome reaction to that. <laughs> yeah, I was super excited about that because it's a distributed system. And I'm like, yeah, let's play with that. This is actually exactly what I looked like when I was sitting in the meeting with the managers. True story. So what had happened was is that the way time actually entered this system, I was through the GPS constellation. And here is what it looks like there. Many people actually stop and think that GPS, the Global Satellite Positioning System, every one of you has that in your smartphones now, are a series of geosynchronous satellites above the Earth. They're really not. It's an entire constellation of 26 satellites where at any one time between 8 and 10 are visible from your spot on the Earth. And you can see as they pass over, uh, it goes that way. So if the thing's not flying and it gets its time and position information from GPS, I have to figure out how to best mock that up. So what exactly does that look like? Well, if we stop and take back and look at GPS time, the GPS time in the commercial segment, in the public segment, are the Navstar satellites. And those are the Navstar uh, radio-based navigational satellite system, RNSS. When I say GPS, that's really a non-specific information system because there are actually a couple of GPS systems in orbit. The one that is produced and managed by the U.S. Air Force at, at the Space and Missile, Missile System Net. Space and Missile Systems Center in California is called the NAVSTAR system. That's what actually uh, every phone uses. The Russians have one called GLONASS. The Europeans are launching one right now, and I do no, the Galileo system. Uh, I believe China has one going up soon. So they really want something that is not uh, strictly under U.S. control. So that airspace is getting very crowded. When you look at time as it comes down from the satellite, it's encoded in two ways. It's encoded using the number of weeks since the GPS epoch and the number of milliseconds from the week start into the week we're at. So at best, when you use your phone to get GPS time, you have millisecond accuracy, which is actually pretty good, all things considered. So if you look at the epoch, uh, if you've ever heard of Unix time, where the epoch is January 1st, 1970, GPS time is actually the time the very first satellite went up into orbit. And that's January 6th, 1980. 0000, 000 universal time, January 6th, 1980. And that's key. And one of the big problems I was running into is that GPS time isn't adjusted for leap seconds. These are just atomic clocks in orbit that all they do is count up. They keep counting. So here's the first head fake. This talk isn't really about time. It's about myths programmers believe about time and why it's stupid hard. Yeah, you weren't expecting that one, were you? Yeah. I know. So let's start with my favorite myth. Really what we're stating is why time is hard. And the first myth is one, two, three. There are always 24 hours in a day. Months have either 30 or 31 days. And years are always 365 days long. These are the first couple ones I always like to hit people with because they really don't realize what this is going through. So before we really get into that, let's talk a little bit of history about time, about what it is and why it's hard. So we're going to step back into the Wayback Machine. The ancient Sumerians, about 3300 BC, started using a calendar system, and they broke it into 30-day months with no concept of the year. They just rolled that all together every single month. <coughs> Each day was broken up into 12 periods. Each period was about two hours or so. And then each period was broken into 30 parts. Each part was about four minutes. So the, the smallest division of time they were using was four minutes. When you actually look at the ancient Egyptians, they were the ones where we actually started using the first 365-day calendar. Here is where we start getting into the interesting words. The, they noticed a key fact that in the, the constellation Canis Major, there's a star called the Dog Star. And every 365 days, that would rise on the exact same side of the sun, in the exact same position. So they stepped back and they were like, what is that? Why is that star rising in that exact same place? And so they came up with the first notion of the sidereal day. And I'll get into that in a second. Lastly, the Babylonians, about 2000 BCE, they used a lunar calendar. So instead of looking at the sun, they looked at how the moon revolved around us. And they really broke it up into 12 alternating 29 and 30 day cycles. Because they realized that it did, the moon did in fact rotate in different increments. Because of that, because of how they rotate around that, they used a 354 day year. 
just a little bit of trivia. You don't really need to know that. But about a thousand in a thousand A.D., there's this gentleman called Abu Rayyan al-Biruni. Now, this is a brilliant mathematician, astronomer, chronologist, and polymath. This is actually a new term I discovered while we were, uh, I was looking about this, a polymath. It is essentially the term of, of Renaissance man. This was a gentleman who was extremely skilled in math, physics, and chronology, and just every aspect of there. And he did some really incredibly cool things. 500 years before Kepler, before Galileo, before all of these huge names come up, he wrote a book called The Chronology of Nations. And this was in uh, 1000 AD. Okay. In this book, he went ahead and outlined the specific lengths of the day, of the hour, and the setting. And I want to read you this quote here because I think, uh, as I was going through, this completely blew me away as to how accurate it was. As to the length of such a revolution in days and fractions of a day, the results of the astronomical observations do not agree, but differ considerably. According to some observations, it is larger, according to others, less. But in the long run of time, when this difference is being redoubled and multiplied many times, a very great error becomes manifest. If you think about, sorry, if you think about time now and really what it does, we have concepts of leap seconds, the day grows shorter and longer throughout the year as the sun moves around the sun. And in 1000 AD, 500 years before Columbus even, even thought about Ceylon Cross, that the world was round, he was realizing that the day cycle, that the length adjusted, he didn't know why. He couldn't pinpoint as to why, but he knew that this was a problem. So, here's what I'm going to reveal the first dirty little secret that nobody really told you. The Earth revolves around the sun. Okay, it's maybe not a really dirty little secret. You've probably heard this before, but you never really thought about what this means and what this actually has an impact on the day. So, I'm going to get into the concept of a sidereal day. I mentioned this. And the idea behind this is that if you have the Earth and the Sun in a rotating pattern, when the Earth rotates a full 360 degrees around, it actually moves. So that same point, you're now pointing off into the distance. You have to rotate another degree to get back to the Sun in the same point of the sky. So those are two initial definitions of the day, of the five that they were talking. There are five definitions of the day. The sidereal day is a full 360 degree motion of the Earth based on a sun, uh, a star in the far distance. And here's kind of what it looks like. You've got a star behind the sun at a sidereal day. The star returns to that same point. And then another four minutes later, the sun will move. And when the sun moves to that same point, we call that a solar day. When the sun does a full rotation around and it returns to that same point in the sky. Now this has two real effects. The first effect is that it drifts through the sky. As we go through, it will actually drift about one degree <coughs> per day as you go through against that star. And the second is, the solar day is about four minutes long. And that's the key. The difference between the sidereal day and the solar day is about four minutes. And it actually adjusts a little bit longer, a little bit more than that. So, I talk about solar time when it actually, when the sun returns to that same point in the sky. That's split into two categories. Apparent solar time and mean solar time. The problem with the sun returning to the same point in the sky is that it differs for wherever you are on the Earth. And that's key. I could be here in Rochester and I could measure the length of the day of how long that sun moves. And it's going to be different if I go to Boston or if I go to Seattle. It's going to have a different length because of the shape of the Earth and how we move. So, how do we resolve those differences? We go through them and we average that over all locations, over all times of the year, over all positions around the uh, orbit of the Earth around the Sun. We call that the mean solar time. And the mean solar time was really the definition of the day for the longest time, when the Sun returns to that same point in the sky. We measure the difference between the two using something really cool. It's called the equation of time. Ooh. Ah, the equation of time. Really majestic sounding. It really isn't that majestic. It looks like this. So over the course of the day of the year, starting at uh, January 1st, going to December 1st, and it rolls over through, the difference between the apparent solar time for any one position and the mean solar time fluctuates between about negative 14 minutes, 14 minutes early, to 17 or 18 minutes late. 
that's going to be a problem. Because if the day is fluctuating through, we don't really know what's going to go on. So that's going to lead me into our next dirty little secret about time. The Earth precesses. Now, the word precess is a fancy little term that just means that as we go through, we have a little bit of a wobble. When I say that, I want you to think of a spinning top. If you spin the top on a table, and I would love to have had one for this, but I couldn't get one, you'll see the top rotates around. You can picture that. Guess what? The Earth rotates around too. This is a cool little fact first identified by Hipparchus in 140 BC as he was noticing that the Earth was moving just ever so slightly. He took, one of the coolest things about him is that he took many, many measurements over the course of the year to determine exactly how much this procession actually has effect. And even in 2,000 years ago, he was about six minutes fast from what it actually was. Now, the coolest thing is that as we go through and as we process around, every uh, 26,000 years, you make a full 360 degree rotation. Now what that means is we do about one degree of rotation every 76 years or so. Doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you really think about it, when you really drill it down, it adds about 8.4 milli SI seconds, and that's going to make a difference here in a little bit, to the day. Here's the next dirty little secret that nobody ever told you about science. The Earth wobbles. This is one of my favorite ones because this absolutely blew my mind when I started looking into this to figure out exactly what it meant by the wobbles. Aren't these dirty secrets technical? Wobbles, they processes, you know, it rotates around the sun. <laughs> so, okay, so, so wobbles, I can't be serious. It, it, you really can't tell me that the Earth just sort of wiggles there. It does. The Earth is not a solid sphere by any method of the imagination. It's really more like an egg. It has a hard outer crust and a liquid variable inner center. So if you ever think about how you spin an egg, it doesn't spin perfectly, it kind of wiggles a little bit and then it slows down and stops. It's not a perfect metaphor, but it's much closer to what actually happens. So as the Earth rotates, that pole, that vertical pole straight at the top, that moves just a little bit every day. And we measure that. We can measure the wobble of that pole. Isn't that cool? Yeah? Or is this, is, am I the only getting excited about this? Because, yeah, OK, I understand. I'm a huge power nerd, but that's cool. Measure all of the things. Measure all of the things. But here's the coolest bit. That wobble changes the length of the day. And we measure that, too. Yeah. So if we look, here's how it wobbles. This is the wobble over the course of a year. And these are milli arc seconds, it's a little bit of a degree, towards the Greenwich median. So if you're looking at the North Pole, you have that uh, x-axis towards Greenwich and towards uh, the uh, other meridian, straight down, not towards Greenwich, at a 90 degree angle. And you can see, as we go through, that we are in fact wobbling just a little bit. In fact, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and goes bigger and bigger and bigger. And we see that how much it changes the length of the day over the course of time. I actually generated this chart from the IERS, the International Earth uh, Rotation Service. This is a group of people split in, uh, I believe they're in California, and there's another group in France. And they both measure it and they compare, and they make their observations completely publicly available to anyone. I got on their website and I was able to generate this chart from January 2011 to uh, about a week and a half ago when I made the chart. And you can see that it actually does fluctuate between you know, a couple of milliseconds every day. So really, yeah, it's not big. But here's the coolest bit. The Earth is actually alive. And here's when I say that. This is another chart that measures the axis of rotation around the Earth. And here's another dirty little secret. When the Earth has an, uh, an earthquake, a really large one, it changes the moment of inertia of the Earth. And we can measure that too. Each one of these dots here is a big earthquake, you remember. You remember the, the, Japan, uh, the earthquake in Japan that, ha that did untold amounts of damage that destroyed the nuclear, side, the nuclear reactors? That really knocked the Earth out of alignment. And that's really adding a whole lot of more wobble to it. We're measuring that. The Earth is in fact alive, and there are all of these sources of error associated with it. So I'm going to introduce a concept here. 
and I'm going to call it universal time. It comes in three flavors. I mean, you may have heard a couple of these before. The first one is UT0, and that's the sidereal time off a star in the distance, uncorrected for the polar wall. That's just as the star moves through. The polar wobble, the precession of the equinoxes, those actually add enough of an issue, enough of a uh, time change, that we need to correct for it. That's when we introduce UT1, universal time 1. That is the, the <coughs> sidereal time corrected for the polar wobble and the polar distance. So when I say UT1, you can think of that as the mean solar time. That's, that's how we've gone through and resolved those two differences, using UT1. The final flavor is something I'm sure we've all heard of, UTC. Universal time coordinated. Coordinated with what? We'll get to that in a second. So, with all of these sources of error, with all of these wibbly wobblies, with all of these little bits there, how do we resolve? How do we associate all of them together to really get one coherent notion of time? We redefine the standard. <laughs> This is a, a scientific definition of what happens when a group of scientists get together to redefine a standard. You get up, table flip, you move on. So, I'm going to introduce TAI. So, this is atomic time. This is uh, TAI, what everyone calls time, uh, temps atomic international. It's French, they named it. I just call it TII, or atomic time. This was established in the, uh, the Conference of Weights and Measures. They redefined the second in 1967. Prior to 1967, the second was 1 86400 of a mean solar day. Where did they get 86400? 24 times 60 times 60. 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. And they just said, okay, one second, divide the solar day by that many bits. Well, we know the mean solar day wibbles and wobbles and it changes over the course of the year, it gets longer, it's shorter. That's, that's not going to work out well. So they drew a line in the sand and they said, okay, we need to define it as something that doesn't change, something external to our sun, moon, and earth uh, three-body system. So they picked the cesium-133 atom, and they defined it as 9,192,631,770 uh, 9 vibrations of the cesium atom. That just sounds like a random number. If you ask me, I think they pulled that number out of their ass, and they just said, nope. That's a number, it sounds good, it's close enough to the second. But there's actually a reason they picked that number. And it's actually kind of cool. That is the resonating frequency of cesium, where it fluoresces. And that'll get apparent here when I talk about how they actually measure time. So let's talk about another dirty little secret that nobody ever told you. The Earth is slowing down. As the Earth actually rotates, it's getting slower and slower and slower. You're like, Sean, that, that's, that's bull. You can't tell me that we're slowing down. I can. Here's why. The moon has gravity, and the moon actually goes through and pulls the tides away from the Earth. As the Earth rotates, it pushes the tide forward. As the tide gets pushed forward, the tide is actually the center of mass of the tide is here or so, pulling the moon forward. It sounds weird because the, the rotation is pulling the moon forward. If it's pulling the moon forward, the moon is speeding up. If the moon is speeding up, because of conservation of energy, the moon speeds up, the Earth slows down. We are actually bleeding energy into the moon. Eventually, the moon will, the Earth is going to stop, stop rotating altogether, and the moon is going to drift away. We are going to lose that moon eventually. But, this is measurable. We measure exactly how much the Earth slows down. And this is something that you all know. You all know what we do to do that, to, to fix this, I'm sure none of you have known why. This is why we have leap seconds. We physically inject a leap second arbitrarily to go through and, act and adjust for this, this movement. We're, we're drifting. Why are we drifting? Because of the tidal breaking. Mean solar time, what we, what we actually used to define the second as, it's drifting away from atomic time. And that's where universal time coordinated comes in. Coordinated with that? UTC coordinates the mean solar time, the, the time of the rotation on the Earth, with atomic time. And the way they coordinate this is using leap seconds. Every so often, when the two of these drift apart enough to the point where they are within, to their approaching 0.9 seconds apart, they add a leap second. 
and that'll drill that down, and that'll keep them in sync. When do we have a leap second? It's, it's pretty arbitrary. As we slow down, we're measuring this, we're constantly measuring how much this is, and it's really when we need to. Typically, it'll only be at the end of the month, and the way they do that is using what they call the IERS Bulletin C. Honestly, this is an email list. You can get onto the IERS website and subscribe to the Bulletin C. I am, because I do a lot of time at work, and so I like to know when leap seconds are added. And that's how they notify everyone. They send a mass email out like, well, we're adding a leap second, guys. Here's when, here's how we're doing it. <laughs> they can do it in one of two ways. They can either add a second at the end of the month, or they can subtract a second. Because we're slowing down, they've never actually subtracted a second. And right now, they've added about 35 leap seconds since introduction to keep that to sync. Here's what it looks like. This grayscale in the background is what you can actually see from 1965 when they started. The grayscale is the change in duration of the day over the course of the time. The grayscale right here is the moving 365 day average over the course of the year. They actually average those lengths of the day together. And this red line is the change. That is exactly how far mean solar time and atomic time, TAI, have been drifting apart. You can barely see these little red dots here every so often. Every little red dot is a leap second they added to go ahead and try and uh, coordinate and bring these two back in sync. I think that's cool. I, I, I really do. I, I really enjoy talking about this. So here's on to another myth. The day of the month always advances from n to n plus 1, or it resets to 1. So we always go from 15 to 16, or we jump back to 1, if we hit 29, 30, or 31. That's not true. And here's why. We're going to go back to September 1752 in the United States and the United Kingdom. This is when we switched from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. And to resolve the two differences in the time, we jumped. We immediately switched to the Gregorian calendar, and 12 days were lost. You can actually, I, I didn't believe this. I didn't believe this. You can run this command from any Linux ca uh, computer. You can get on there and do it right now. And this is what appears. 1, 2, 14. What? Where did those 12? They never existed. They never happened. If you ever see a date that says September 10th, 1752, it didn't happen. It didn't exist. Time is not linear. It jumps around. Durations aren't linear. But you're saying, Sean, Sean, that was over 200 years ago. Why is that even relevant to what I do now? Think about it. If you're writing software for a domain, something like a museum catalog, genealogy, if you're going back to land deeds, legal cases, if, even if you're doing old astronomical stuff, you have to account for some of these things when you're actually doing software. You have to account for 12 days of, of nothing blank in the calendar where it just didn't exist. So how about another myth? Huh. See? You, you ran it, he's like, crap, he's right, he's not making this stuff up. So let's look at another myth. Uh, so actually, if you, if between 1582 and 1923 is when the Earth switched from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. And the problem with the Julian calendar, that was introduced by Julius Caesar, named after himself because he, like me, had a rather large ego. He decided that, he realized that it wasn't exactly 365 days, it was 365 days and a quarter. So every four years, or every four years, he added a leap day, which is why we have February 29th. The problem is that it's not exactly a quarter. And after 128 years, there was an error that started to build up, and that started to go through, and the Gregorian calendar corrected that error. So between the between 15th October, 1582, was when the first country switched over, through 1 March 1923, which is when I believe Russia switched over to the Gregorian calendar, you have no idea what the exact date is. It has no meaning unless you identify what country that's from and what calendar they're using. I can see a lot of faces like, crap, holy crap, I know people older than that. And you know what, that's, that's a problem. There's actually a really cool fact about this. Uh, in 1917, we've all heard of Red October, the Red October revolu revolution of Russia with the Bolsheviks. That lasted 
20, uh, it started on October 25th, and it went to 7 November. 25 to 7. That was a period of one day. Because when the revolution ended, they changed the calendar. Because when the revolution started, when the communists came into power, they immediately switched <coughs> over to the Gregorian calendar, which happened to be at November 7th. That's awesome! <laughs> <laughs> So another thing, <coughs> we're talking about the Julian calendar, how every four years he introduced a leap day. Oh, ooh, there's also one on every millennium. There is. Actually, we'll talk about that. But the key is that not every leap year is divided by four. Only on the Julian calendar, if you just say year divided by four, your, if your module of four is zero, that works. Because it introduced an error, it was one full day ahead every 128 years. And so the Gregorian calendar fixed this. And here's the cool thing. And they realized this, by 1582, the seasonal equinoxes were coming 10 days early. The equinoxes were just they were happening right, and, and the, the monks table flipped and said, we need a new calendar. They, came, they named it after themselves, because that's what people would want to do, because they have egos, and they called it the Gregorian calendar. <laughs> it was really funny, because some church holidays, like Easter, were in the completely wrong season. It, it was just sort of moving through the year. And so they, they resolved that time. And here's how you properly determine whether or not a year is a leap year. The first thing you do, if, is it divisible by four? If it's not divisible by four, it's not a leap year, right off the top. It must not be divisible by 100. 2100, 2200, 2300, uh, not leap years. Unless it's also divisible by 400. Given those three rules concatenated together, that is how you accurately determine whether or not a year is a leap year or not, and whether it has February 29th as a date. So I see you getting bored by that. So how about another couple of myths? These are some of more interesting ones. One minute on the system clock has exactly the same duration as any other clock. Okay, but the duration of one minute on the clock is going to be uh, going to be pretty close to every other clock. Yeah, no, no, no. fine, fine. But the duration of one clock will never be more than an hour. You've got to be kidding me. We're going to talk... Not, not just clock speeds. Uh, I'm going to go into one of our first case studies. The, uh, the KVM CentOS bug. And I've got a link to the bug here. When you post the, the PowerPoint online, you can actually go to the bug report. This is a really cool bug that had to do it. So a KVM virtual machine, when you suspended it, it had no idea it was on virtual hardware. It was assumed it was on actual hardware. When you're on actual hardware, it has a physical hardware clock that constantly ticks up. So if you're on virtual hardware and you don't know that, you need to know exactly how to best adjust your time. It didn't. So when you suspended the KVM, it would freeze the system clock at whatever time you suspended it. So if you suspended it at 12 noon and woke it up to uh, three hours later at 1500, it would still say noon. Even with NTP, the network time protocol, to slew it back together, the jump was too far off, it couldn't resolve it, and it was just completely off. It, it was too big to compensate for and it wouldn't work. Number of software failed when it was doing this because that length of a minute was suddenly jumped. NTP was reporting a different thing and everything exploded. Bug has since been fixed, it now knows that it is on virtual hardware. Bug submitted in May of this year. Recent bug. It, all, all of the case studies I talk about, uh, most, like 90% of them have happened this year. Everything is recent. We are still running into date and time bugs throughout the entire, e even now, nobody has gotten it 100% right. <laughs> so I'll take another myth. Timestamps always advance monotonically. They always count up and they will never count down. Ah, that sounds a little hokey. So let's figure out exactly why that's the case. Let's look at a function uh, from Windows called git tick count. Now this function returns the number of system ticks, and that's how uh, any operating system measures time. Uh, it's not seconds, it's units of measure of units of state through the system as it transitions through its state machine since boot up. Never mind the fact it means that tick means something completely different depending on what operating system, what hardware, and what you're on. It's, it just it has no meaning in time, like jiffies. A jiffy is an actual unit. When I say be back in a jiffy, that actually has a time length meaning, but it's different for every computer system you're on. And here's the problem. It returned a 32-bit number. This number rolled over every 29 days. When I say rolled over, the 32-bit number, you can't get too big for it, and it went from really, really big 
to zero. I'm going to slam down. If you remember back into the old Windows 9X bugs, did your computer crash about once a month? Yes. Completely through screen? Yes. You probably had a bug in a driver that was using Git tint cabinet rolled over. That's probably why it was blue screen. Someone didn't do their date math right. How about another myth as we can go through? 4748, you got a double one. Unix time, we've all heard of. Completely ignorant about everything except ten, uh, seconds. Second since January 1st, 1970. And 48, Unix time is the number of seconds since 1970. Both of which are wrong. I'm seeing looks like, what? I mean, we all know what the Unix timestamp is. How could that be wrong? Not quite. The Unix epoch is 1970, January 1st, at 0000, Universal Time Coordinated. The problem is that UTC, Universal Time Coordinated, didn't exist in its current form with leap seconds and everything else until 1972. It's completely meaningless between 1970 and 1972. It cannot be resolved to an actual time, to an actual instant in this universe. Started at zero on the epic, and it increases by 86400 each TAI day. And when I say TII day, I do mean the, the atomic time. Leap seconds are completely ignored. There's no concept of leap second in uh, Unix time. So what happens is, so if you're actually going through, it counts up 9, 10, 10, 11. It actually goes 10 twice, it repeats a second. So the problem with that is, they are completely ambiguous. I can say 10, and you don't know which 10 that was, whether that was the repeated second or the second immediately afterwards. So it's actually kind of cool that way. It has two different variants. You can either base it off the atomic time, which is unaffected by leap seconds, or UTC. So, let's talk about time zones, real quick. The machine that a program runs on will always be in the local time zone. If I'm looking at my machine, I'm, it's always going to be in Eastern time. No, oh, okay, that was not true. But at least the time zone that a program runs in will not change. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, surely there'll never be a change in the time zone in which a program has to run in production. Once I deploy it, the time zone will never change. Oh. The server clock and the computer clock will use the same time zone. Never. I have seen people make every one of these assumptions on there. The offsets between two time zones remain constant. Time zones will never change. And, okay, look, historical oddities aside, for when weird crap happened in the past, the offsets between two time zones won't change in the future. Change in the offsets between time zones will, will occur of plenty of advance notice. I've grouped all of the time zone myths together so I can kill them all in one smooth and we can get rid of all misconceptions about time zones because they're a problem. So let's talk about them. They're fickle. They're not defined by any standard body. There's no international organization that defines time zones. They're done by the government of whatever country they're in. And the problem is, is that once a new regime comes into power, they like to muck with the time zones just to get their hands dirty. When they muck with these time zones, they don't really give advance notice. At, at worst, I've seen someone give 12 hours notice of a time zone change, and everyone has to run around like a chicken with their heads cut off trying to get everything back together. Most time zones differ from UTC by an integer number of hours, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Currently, we're not in the... Currently, we're at UTC minus 4 for our offset here. Plus 14. It goes from negative 12 to plus 14. But a few aren't exactly integers. They're off by 30 or 45 minutes. Plus 14. Plus 14. Time zones in some places are based off of the mean solar time and not UTC. So it depends entirely on where you are. When I say GMT, I do mean the mean solar time passing through the meridian at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, London. Not all places observe daylight savings time. The, easy, I'm sorry, the easiest way to calculate them is using this basic function. Convert your time zone, time zone A where you are, into UTC, and then bounce it back from UTC to the target time zone. That's the easiest way to do it. There are three myths on here that I didn't include. Time zones are always whole hours away. They're not. Daylight savings time starts and ends in the exact same day everywhere. <laughs> and daylight savings time always moves by an hour. And here's a big wall of text. Now, I'm not going to read this, but this is actually an announcement that came down from Morocco, how they were doing their time zones. The very first one, 
March 9th, they announced that they'd observe daylight savings time on the 25th. Then they announced they weren't, wouldn't observe daylight savings time during Ramadan. But we have no idea when that actually meant, what time they were talking about during Ramadan. On the 15th, they announced that they'd observe daylight savings time on April 28th. They then changed that and they amended that to say they'd observe daylight savings time starting on the 24th. But that would be okay. Then Thailand and the Falklands moved in. Cuba moved the switch to 11 March. From 11 March to the 1st April, Haiti made a change, Syria made a change, and the Gaza and the West Bank. They're fickle, they're defined by governments, and I really only have one thing to say about that. Here's a colorful graph. These are all the world's time zones as you go through them. These are all of the ones they change, they alter, they adjust. Ooh, look at the rainbow on Antarctica. I know, it's pretty, isn't it? Here's another problem, though. Here's who observes daylight savings time. Oh, look at Canada. <laughs> the blue observes daylight savings time. This light orange here does not observe daylight, time, daylight savings time, but they did at one point. And these red ones, they've never observed daylight savings time. Here's the fun bit. They don't observe it now, but they did at one point. So you have to go back into the historical records to figure out exactly when they did, what hour offset they were, to resolve any time in those countries. Yeah. You can determine the time zone from the state or province. If I gave you a city, you can say, that's the time zone. No. It doesn't work that way. If I were to give you a city and drill down to that one, can you determine the time zone from that? No. no. Some time zones actually bisect cities and cut them in half. You can actually go from one half of the city to the other. It'll be in two different time zones. But the only thing I can tell you is, I, IANA, the International Association for Numbers or something and something, I don't remember what it stands for. Anyway, they produce what they call the time zone database. It's available at IANA.org slash time hyphen zones. Use this. This is a standards body whose sole purpose is to go through and manage the time zones, and they do a damn good job about it. They, they have an email list, you can get updates, so whenever it updates, you can see that. If you have to do anything with time zones, anything at all, I highly recommend you to use this. This is such a great resource. So I'm going to revision F for this year. They, uh, I'm telling you, governments are fickle things. They're, they're up to revision F, and they're going to go through four more revisions at the end of the year. Mark my words. 107. Time passes at the same speed on top of a mountain at the bottom of the valley. Here's the fun bit. We're going to talk about the GPS satellites. When they went ahead and launched, General Relativity states that as gravity increases, as you get close to something body, time slows down. What that actually means is when you get to a black hole, time actually is effectively stopped. Every, every weird crap happens in a black hole. But as you move out of the gravity well, time speeds up. You can think this is a problem. We have uh, about 34 GPS satellites currently orbiting above the Earth. They are above our gravitational well. The GPS satellites actually move faster. And, and you also have the Earth you know, rotating, wobbling, and processing everything beneath those. And that it's really cool how they, they adjust for all that. But that's not what we're going to talk about. The problem, though, is when they launched them, they realized that the, the atomic clocks in orbit would move faster than atomic clocks on the ground. And they adjusted for this. They actually, before they launched the satellite, they slowed the atomic clocks down in orbit just enough so that the ones in orbit would tick at the exact same rate as the ones on the ground. Provided they stayed at the same altitude. Well, provided they stayed at the same altitude, provided a whole bunch of different things. But there are actually a series of corrections that are transmitted to the GPS satellites that actually come down that will actually allow you to slew your clock in sync with GPS time. So let's talk about some recent things that have happened in 2012 associated with time. Now, I was going to add a couple of slides, but I really didn't want to break 70 slides. And the first one I want to talk about is the SSC proof, the SSC events calendar. If you look, the very first event on there is the, the mind-blowing tech talk that you can't really see now because it's clicked off. I noticed that this morning. And I, was, and I was trying to figure out how it was coded, and I was asking, is that right? Do we actually pop events off the top of the stack, and is it actually, uh, is that actually still there? After they went through and determined that it wasn't user error, that everything was in fact uh, uploaded properly, they went ahead and looked and found that for that event, because of how it was added, the time zone for which the event was added 
was not the time zone on the server. So that event has actually been hit by uh, a time bug. Has not been committed, has not been fixed yet, but every time I look at them, I'm like, hee hee, you know, they get hit by a time zone bug. Yeah, I thought it was amusing. That event was actually yesterday, and it should have disappeared. Because the, and what it actually comes to, the reason it's still being displayed is the, uh, the Google TV that it's running on is on a different time zone than the server is. The server's running UTC, and that's running uh, Eastern Time Daylight Savings. Fun crap! But it's scheduled it on Thursday. Well, the Today is Friday. Event thing. Yeah. Time zone problems. So let's get to what, was, what I thought was originally going to be my first case study before I, I saw that. Let's talk about Windows Azure. Who here has heard of Windows Azure? Show of hands. If you haven't, this is a really cool service that actually has uh, it's a virtual machine, virtual computing service. So the way they had it, they have a whole bunch of uh, virtual machines talking to each other, and the way they did that was over HTTPS. That was their command and control system. And they would issue certificates for HTTPS to go through and authenticate and make sure that everything's on the up and up. So what happened was, is on February 29th, when they got around, a whole bunch of certificates expired, and they simply added one to the year. February 29th, 2013, doesn't exist. Yeah. It flat out doesn't exist. It's not a leap year, so 29th doesn't exist. And when they went through and tried to do this, the certificate creation failed. They simply said, no, I can't create it. That's an invalid expiration date. So it flat out failed. When that failed, that started a cascading reaction through their system and actually caused the, the Azure Compute Service to fail. Service was between intermittent and completely unreachable for over 32 hours until they were able to pull everything down, fix the bug, and restart the service. This is Microsoft we're talking about here, who's one of their, well, I can't say it's a flagship product, it's actually used by quite a few people, and, an, and to be hit by a bug like this is kind of impressive. But sure, it's a big monolith. We can all joke that Microsoft, ha, 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 they're not the greatest software company in the world. So, what's your alternative? Let's talk about Linux. So, in June of this past year, we added a leap second. This is actually a fantastic year for time bugs. We had both a leap day, February 29th, and a leap second. So what happened was, is that whenever you call sleep or nano sleep in any Linux system, that drills down to a system call, and that drills down to what we call the HR timer, the high resolution timers interface within the kernel. It's kind of an alarm clock for processors. I say I want to sleep for 500 milliseconds. That sets an alarm clock for me 500 milliseconds. Now I sleep and the system wakes me up immediately after that. When the leap second hit, it wasn't corrected for, it wasn't thought of, and the HR timer subsystem was one second ahead of the operating system. When it was one second ahead, it caused every single timer in that second window to expire at exactly the same time. Because it was still a second ahead for an entire second, every timer kept expiring constantly. This drove every CPU on these servers up to near 100% and completely brung everything down. Because of the way Java does their date and time and their, their management system, it hit Java extraordinarily hard. Tomcat, Cassandra, Hadoop, all of these major big software things that run a lot of really important systems and servers all had issues. They all had significant issues. This affected Gawker, Reddit, Mozilla, Opera, many others. Yeah. Completely brought Reddit to its knees. I know that's not hard, <laughs> given how, how spotty it's been, but this is one of the reasons that it actually completely went down. This is actually really cool. So let's talk about something else that affects everyone, that we all affect in software. We're going to talk about date time rollovers. And I can guarantee you every single one of you has heard of one of these problems. And one of these are Y2K. These are led because when we store dates and times, we have a computer. We have a finite amount of memory to store them in. When we store a year, we can store it as two decimal digits. If we're talking about the GPS time system, it's stored as 10 binary bits. That's actually how we encode the week. That means the GPS week rolls over every 1,024 weeks or 19 and change years. A Y2K, because they were storing it as two decimal digits, they went ahead and put it as 00. zero. Well, what's 00, zero mean? Is that 1900 or 2000? Lastly, a fun one that most people don't realize, no. So let's, let's step it up. Let's use 32 bits. So the Unix Epic, the Unix time, the 
timestamp is stored in a 32-bit number, and that will roll over in the year 2038. So there's a 2038 bug. So if you're using a 32-bit version of Linux in the year 2038, you're going to have your own version of Y2K. Chew on that one for a while. Nobody, nobody is immune to these things. 64-bit computers. Last myth I'm going to talk about. Your software will never have to run in a spaceship that's orbiting a black hole. Surely this one's a joke. My software, my iPad, is never going to orbit a black hole. You never know. When you actually think about the relativity issues and everything else, how you talk in the space, how you move it, there are so many different problems that you can, uh, problems that come about when you start dealing with dates and times. I want to talk about a couple closing thoughts real quick. Oh, well, I'm actually kind of close to an hour. That was, that was good. Voltaire said, perfection is the enemy of good enough. And when it comes to date and time, I tend to agree. No software has gotten it 100% correct. A lot of it have gotten close, but no one's completely there. And the key behind that are requirements. When you're going through and you're designing software to deal with any bits of dates, anything of time, you have to figure out what your requirements are. You have to go through and figure out how much and how close to good enough can I get. And you only implement as far as you can because there's no possible way you can cover all historical oddities of dates, times, and all different aspects of how you go through and do uh, time, the length of the day, associated with the Earth. And when I'm talking about software, this is a very pedantic description. Finished is not complete. Complete implies you have hit every single possible edge case, whereas when you're dealing with date and time, you got to deal with good enough. You're not going to be able to hit every single thing. And I know for a lot of people, me included, that's a really hard topic. I want to be able to cover, I want unit tests that fully execute and fully test every aspect of my system, but I can't get there. You complete an assignment, you complete and cover everything about it, but you finish software and then you release it and you cover whatever you can. So, thanks for listening. Uh, my flight tomorrow leaves at noon, so if, if you don't get anything, if you need, want me to review anything, talk about time, you can always email me, sean.madden at basystems.com. But while I'm here, questions, comments, concerns, other ideas, ventings. Yeah? NanoSleep is the standard command in Linux distributions, is it? NanoSleep is, I believe, defined in the POSIX standards. Certain versions of Linux can choose to implement it and choose not, but it does not always have the accuracy of a nanosecond. It'll, it will at least a nanosecond, but sometime after that, when the processor actually has the ability to go through and wake you up, it's at least a nanosecond to go through. Yeah? So you mentioned on one of the slides that um, it was in like 10 to 20 second nanometers or nanoseconds yep. of time accuracy could be like five meters off. Yes. So if you're lazy with some of these values, like say you aren't taking into account like wobble of the earth, for example, mm -hmm. like what sorts of like how, like how off would you be? Would you like be like over like a mile away, you know, another state, another country? Uh, I'll answer that with this. Do you know how fast light moves? Uh, fast. About that far. Speed of light is about one foot per nanosecond. So if you actually stop and think, exactly how many nanoseconds can I be off? If I'm one millisecond off, that's a thousand nanoseconds. That's one thousand feet of light. So, depending, so based on that, you can just basically say, I, I have this much leeway, here's how close I can be. Okay. Answer your question? Yeah. Good. Yes? Hey, so um, you deal at base systems, you deal with like a lot of software that basically can't fail for a number of reasons. That's correct. So what, um, do you have anything in your code, or have you found ways to kind of deal with the oddities of time, or just in case an oddity ever were to pop up? Or mm -hmm. do you just go with like a good enough kind of scenario? I assume you do something as we, far as time. We do a couple of different things. Uh, most of what we do though is in fact good enough. Your best resource for time to get the current time and get the future things are in fact the GPS satellites. There are five stations across the globe currently updating the GPS satellites and they actually provide coordinated time. They are, uh, when we talk about NTP, we talk about stratum level servers. And a, basically a stratum is how close you are to a root time source. When I say a root time source, I mean an atomic clock, something that is disciplined and can't fail. So we consider, we BAE systems and a lot of companies consider the GPS satellites to be a stratum zero time source. 
that are the best possible approximation of UTC you can possibly get. So most of what we do when we build UAVs or when we build uh, systems, we actually have, for not just position, but for time, we have a GPS receiver in there that will actually go through and pull and get that hyper-precise time on there. Failing that, if we don't have access to GPS for some reason where we can't use it for the current program, we will actually embed uh, disciplined atomic clocks on that system itself to get the current time and actually discipline them for clocks to gate our computers to keep everything in sync. So a little bit of A, a little bit of B, but in terms of software, which I think we, where you were really going for it, we really don't. We rely on these other hardware mechanisms to go through and do that for us. And we do that in, uh, in hardware. So, um, I, I don't know, this might seem like a silly question, but um, do you know anything about, um, well, there's supposed to be, like, I've heard a lot of news about, like, using light instead of electricity, like uh, quantum uh, electricity, mm -hmm. uh, quantum mechanics or whatever. Yep. Um, so does that play a part into keeping track of time instead of just, you were mentioning before, like, processors are, like, somewhere near a nanosecond, but will, like, this change to using light, uh, higher the uh, effectiveness or the closeness to what time actually is? I haven't really, I, I would love to see those articles because I haven't heard anything about using light or time yet. So if you can link me or, e or email a couple of these articles, I would love to read them. Uh, in terms of switching over from electrons to light, uh, the way electrons are transmitted through the system, I don't think we're really going to have uh, that much of a difference because we've gone from electrons to photons and they travel at about the same speed and we'd be using them at about the same way, using the intensity of the photons versus the intensity of the electrons. So I don't perhaps, I don't perhaps see much of a change in that. I don't really see the, everyone pivoting over to that. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. Actually, if you want to stick around real quick, uh, I'm going to post this line, but here's a couple actual reading resources about things I've spoken about. First one, uh, Abu Al-Biruni, really interesting read. Uh, I actually got a free copy of his book, uh, The Compilation of Time, that's available on Google Books completely free. Uh, it blew my mind when I read it. Just think about it, it was written over a thousand years ago, and how close he was to getting everything right. The INA, Time Zone Database, The NIST History of Time, a little bit about February 30th, <laughs> actually exists in some calendars. It does. Uh, the Soviet Union, Red October Revolution, and finally, uh, on my wiki, seanmadden.net, uh, wiki.seanmadden.net, I have the full compiled list of 113 myths that I've gathered over the course of time. So when we post this, if you're still interested, you can either come see me, shoot me emails, we can discuss that, jump through there, read through those resources. So, one thing I do really want to talk about, I mentioned this, but atomic clocks. Here's how they work, and it's super cool. So what they are, they're called atomic fountains. All modern atomic clocks, even the ones in space, use this design. What they do is they gather right through here. They use lasers to push cesium atoms together. They launch them up through this portal, and they just float back down by gravity. And as they pass through this section right here, well, they get ionized through here. And as they pass through this section, they shoot a laser through. And here's a video of that. They shoot it up, it stops, it just floats down by gravity, and when it gets to that point, they shoot a laser through it. Now, if you remember when I was talking about how they define the second, it was the natural fluorescing frequency of the cesium atom, the natural base frequency. So they take a laser, and they hit it at the frequency of the cesium atom, and they actually have a light sensor. that They cycle the frequency of the laser from uh, a lower frequency to a high one, and it actually goes light, 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 bright, 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 light, light, light. Didn't, didn't. And what they do is they use that to what we call discipline the laser to that frequency. And the point where the cesium atoms are the brightest is the frequency of the second. And we send that to a counter, and that gives us how fast the second is. That's some cool crap there. Atomics. All right. Thanks for listening. Oh, yes. One more question. You sure. said sometimes you have to embed an atomic clock on whatever you're making. How big are they? Uh, this. We don't embed atomic fountains, if you actually look. Uh, this is an atomic fountain. If you, uh, uh, For a frame of reference, they're probably about that tall, or so they're a pretty big one. We do not use uh, full-on atomic fountains. We do something modified. We use uh, cesium discipline oscillators, where they go through and use a different technique about that. 
Uh, I can't tell. I can't really talk too much about exactly how they. Google cesium disciplined oscillator. Look at the Wikipedia page, and that will tell you exactly how they do it. They're about that big. They're incredibly small. They'll actually get you reasonably close. Of the five main atomic clocks in the world, there are in fact five. This is what they use because this is the most accurate method of doing it. And then to get TAI, they average them all together. It's actually kind of cool. Any other questions? Thanks for coming. Uh, I think there's still Pete's in the back of the room. Thanks for listening to me drone on for uh, a slightly over an hour. I think I'm at an hour and two based on this talk. So thanks for having me. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all at the Winter Ball when I come back. Mm -hmm.